Today is uh, Sunday, November 3rd, 2019, and it's about uh, 9.50 a.m. here in Pasadena. This is the weekend update that usually goes out on Saturday, and I've let this go another 24 hours because I was thinking about how to present this information. Um, as I said, in prior communications, um, I wanted to discuss some things here that I haven't mentioned in the past. Uh, this is not uh, hiding something in the closet so much as just really trying to figure out when exactly I could uh, bring this part of the story out. So why, you know, why do I continue to work on this when the stock tables show that I don't have a stake? Um, I obviously don't have any reserves and that's not been the case from the time that Pretty much the 10 years ago when everything collapsed uh, until now, it's all been a function of uh, credit and, and repaying of credit and borrowing it again and repaying it again. That's been the whole story uh, for the last 10 years from the crash. So why continue to work on this with such huge odds and it's pretty much been that way since the start. In fact, when we first started putting the fundraising together in the very start, I got some chuckles over the, uh, I guess, <clears throat> older, wiser hands knew that I was undertaking something, the scope of which I didn't truly understand at the time, which if I look at the timeline, uh, that's clearly been the case. So why continue to do this? What is the backstory behind all this? Well, uh, there's a lot of pieces to it, but I'll try to keep it simple for the sake of this particular video. Um, I don't believe that there are any particular accidents uh, in life. I look back over my timeline and I can see things that were clearly, at the time, seemed like happenstance. But looking at the big picture, it's it, it, it wasn't the case. and. It isn't a matter of just assembling a convenient backstory to fit your present situation. I mean, some of this stuff, if I went through it line by line, you would understand. It just, it's hard to see anything other than um, a bigger, bigger idea at work. Um, you know, the fact that I'm not particularly a sports fan being involved in the sports business, I mean, that's kind of strange all by itself, but then some say, well, that'll give me a more objective view of it. And I think that has been the case. I'm not, I don't have any particular biases about anything. It's just numbers, logic, and uh, that kind of thing. So who knows? Um, the why behind the what though, for me has been in going down to Costa Rica 20 years ago. It's actually a little more than 20 years ago now to witnessed the firsthand boom of offshore sports gambling in a big way to understand how that industry worked, to see the effects on the culture. I mean, you could literally see the effects taking place. When I mean the culture, I mean the local culture of such a massive infl uh, influx of funds. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said about that, and that's for another day. But i don't believe it's all as positive as everybody would like to paint. And I, I witnessed that firsthand. Um, that and then the inner workings of that industry and what it takes to be profitable and the kind of techniques and tactics that are used uh, just is not something I would, I'm just not willing to do any of that. And I never have had to do that to be uh, successful in business. So I couldn't handle that. Um, living in a third world country, I got um, a good look at income disparity and having never lived outside of the U.S. before, I'd never seen anything like this. Of course, we see it on television shows, but Americans truly are um, very much in a bubble. And I think it takes a while to get out of that bubble uh, before you realize you're in the bubble. I would say at least a year, maybe longer, of living somewhere permanently, not as a tourist. So 
um, combination of things kind of led to this discovery, and some of you do know part of this story, but I don't think you know the part that I really, that it really touched me personally that turned this into a more than just a business opportunity kind of idea, but a social mission. And that was uh, the effect that gambling has on, on the, the public. Um, to a lesser degree, the effect it has on sports. I, I realized that later on as, as, you know, digging into the research, you don't get all this stuff up front. Anybody who says they've had it all figured out from the beginning is, is being disingenuous. It's, it's sort of revealed to you over time. Uh, that's been the case with me. And so it was the appetite from essentially the first world in sports gambling, um, you know, how rabid that was. I had an, absolutely no idea, never really thought about it, never had a reason to think about it. Um, the amount of passion and resources and time and energy and money put behind that was astounding to me, especially sending it offshore. Uh, doing research into what, how it affects sports specifically, and then that, you know, leads to all kinds of other questions. And then really the biggest question of all was um, income disparity. Now, I had never seen, I mean, I saw it writ large in Costa Rica, which is not even a particularly bad case of it. But it, it got me to really questioning how the world economy works and what is the reason for this gap? I mean, here you have, in Costa Rica, you have one of the major highways divides what's essentially the expatriate and the business class people from uh, people that are literally about to fall down a ravine in, into a, a, a wash from the uh, road that runs off from the road. That kind of a gap I've never seen so starkly in front of my face. I mean, never demonstrated so clearly. Uh, of course, I've seen it in some numbers and some news reporting, but at age 29, 30 years old, when I first saw this in person, it was shocking. So here you have North American, uh, mainly your Western European uh, customers sending into this small country these untold tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars, not really benefiting the local population, um, but just going off to somewhere else or being, you know, lots of expensive houses in those expensive neighborhoods. And meanwhile, everything continues to fall down the hill on the other side. So um, <clears throat> I couldn't um, get past that site and it haunted me and caused me to dig and dig and dig until I realized that the problem is essentially uh, half the world is, about half the world is food insecure, meaning that they don't know where their next meal is coming from. So what are all the reasons for these gaps, okay? So this is the, you know, aside from coming through to uh, our stockholders and stakeholders from the very start, in the early 2000s, so 2003, 2004 range till now, of course, uh, you know, the development of this has been paid for by others, as well as through my own efforts and direct funding and loaning of money and do donating far less of, you know, lower of market rate for my time. It's been the case from the beginning. I've never tried to take any more than it was necessary and offset it through other means like other forms of income. So giving up my stake um, in exchange for services and donating it to other people and all of that sort of thing is how we got here. So why continue? Um, well, I, you know, when I started to see how, how rabid this appetite was for sports gambling and then you know, having had some stock trading experience, that was the evolution of the basic idea of why not a sports stock market. And then having known Ace from years before that as a pretty much one of a kind programmer that can do whatever it takes with whatever you have, that's how it came to life. So um, 
digging deeper into how the world economy functions, I discovered that there were gaps here that based on our theories of, of how sports as an asset class would work, um, would fill these gaps. And you would not only have this really interesting new way to mix uh, sports and money, but you'd also have a, a system for uh, filling in the middle class, you know, not just here in the U.S., but uh, everywhere ultimately. It would start here as all these technologies do, and then it would proceed on from here once it's uh, blueprinted and basically worked out. So uh, it seemed like really an ideal uh, solution to the desire to speculate on sports with money, but in a market environment, which is going to be economically useful, whereas gambling markets do not have any economic use, and economic use is not profit for the operators. <laughs> that doesn't qualify. Uh, economic use means it's useful in the economy. It can be used to, to generate useful price information. It can be used to hedge risks. It can be used as an investment tool. It can be used as a capital formation tool. So um, taking sports and, and monetizing it would be nothing short of the combination of the stock market, uh, you know, the, the creation of a stock market, the very first stock market, which was by the Dutch hundreds of years ago, and uh, combining that with the discovery of oil. And why the comparison? Because we believe that sports is just as pervasive as petroleum is in the economy or very close to it. It's way up there. So when you create a new asset class around an industry that's never had an asset class before, then you're going to create economic activity that's never been seen before. And that is enough of a new thing because that's what the economy needs to have, not just in the U.S., but everywhere in the world. It needs something new. It's, we're recycling the same things over and again. Um, you know, we've been as far as, as agriculture and, and really metalworks are going to go. Uh, the tech bubbles just go from one area to another. It's kind of creative accounting, just moving the numbers around the page. Um, we need a new discovery, and we believe that that new discovery is, is sports as an asset class. And we've been saying that for more than 15 years now. So I do believe that on the core principles, um, it is sports is pervasive. It's the largest identifiable retail industry in the world. If that's not the case, I would like to see figures for something larger than that. Um, it's pervasive. It touches everywhere. And, and the concept of investment being superior to gambling, I think, is true on its face. So when you have those two things, uh, I mean, that those two concepts I don't think are going to change, then your core principles are sound, which is something that uh, Elon Musk talks about going back to these types of things. So is that core principle of is investment superior to gambling? Yes, I don't think anybody will argue the contrary with a straight face. Is, uh, is sports pervasive and enormous? I don't think anybody's going to argue that or find a larger retail industry that's not infrastructure um, type stuff or military even maybe. Uh, that's going to be it. So the tool, if you, if you put those together in the right combination, then there will be there's something really huge. It's just as, I mean, if I did not believe this, I would not be sitting here for such a long time, having gone through at least for the last decade. Uh, I mean, there was a lot more happening in the first five years uh, in turn, because it took off really fast. And there was a lot of excitement and people coming with this and that. But the five years between the crash, 2000 late 2008 to uh, late 2014, it's 2009 to 2014, uh, that period was nothing short of, uh, it's a story of faith. I mean, I, this is probably not the place to get into that on this video, but it is part of the story and it would not be honest of me to, to say anything otherwise. Um, I have seen 
so many instances where we've been right near the edge of destructions. I mean, if I had an index card for every time I was staring in the abyss and something came along and took us off the edge of the abyss, I could fill a wastebasket full with, with index cards, throwing them in. Um, that's the truth of it. I've seen more miraculous just-in-time uh, things, especially in the very beginning when I was literally, uh, there's a handful of times when I would have, I would have thrown my computer out the window and it didn't happen. Um, something would always happen. Some positive, suddenly some piece of news would sun, something would show up, something would come in the mail every single time. Uh, so I've seen that throughout this entire history, no matter how bad the attacks have gotten, no matter what sort of trouble we seem to be going through. I mean, if I heard, if I repeated back the number of times when I heard from somebody, this is the end, we're never going to make it. I mean, again, that, that's another half wastebasket full of those. So, uh, and especially in the very beginning when I wasn't sure of the math and I actually went to Alper with this and said, look, is there something fundamentally wrong with the math? Because if there's something fundamentally wrong with the math or the design, then I'm not even going to try to hold it together. We'll just call this a day and we're done and we tried and the great recession came and wiped us out that was in fact i was encouraged to go that way and it may have even saved my family staying together quite frankly i guess i'll never know the answer to that but uh, i had promised not to quit until there was a real wall in front of us and i haven't seen one and i still don't see one so why continue to believe um you know, I've seen this before 10 years ago when everybody gets dispirited and we're down to a small, very small number of people who seem to be paying attention. But I would ask that just um, give me until the end. You know, if you want to use a word, the word is faith. OK, just give me a little bit more faith until the end of the year. I said to the to the core team, including enough of the shareholders that make a more than 50% that if we get through the end of this year and there is no, nobody's happy with this and, the, and we have another plan. I mean, part of not being happy with the way things are going is you have to be put up a workable plan in alternate. Uh, you can't just say, I don't like what's happening. And then that's it. You know, a real offer for a change in direction comes with a plan that's workable based on where we are. Okay. Rehashing the, fa the, the past or anything like that is not going to, it's of no point. Okay. We are where we are. We, we have to work from here. And if we get to the end of the year and everybody's unhappy with that and has a workable plan that they want to put forward, whatever that means, including my roles, I've already said this before, then I will do it. If, if more than 50% of the people want to do it, then so be it. Um, but not until the end of next month. Okay, I've asked for this from all the way from last year, actually. So um, there are reasons to believe. Uh, you know, first of all, I would say the main reason to believe is that this market simply doesn't die. And it it's not based upon just bonus margin because some people are not taking the, any bonus margin with, with the items that are on the catalog. And in times past, we've had much, much more rapid rate of bonus margin going into the market, but the price doesn't, the market values don't change. The, the uh, market cap doesn't change. So it's not just people going, well, I have bonus margin, so I might as well buy up. That's actually not true. If I look at the reports, an awful lot of accounts are sitting there with bonus margin unused. So they're engaging with the market because they're engaging with the market. Um, the bonus margin plays some some role, uh, like stimulus does in the in the in the stock markets, and it does in our economy. What the Fed is doing with repo operations, but it is not all of it. It doesn't automatically cause people to to spend it because it's it's not going to expire until the program is closed, which means the market is being converted to the exempt or regulated market. So it, it's acting the same way. So 
people can sit on it. They don't have to spin it. They can disregard it. And again, I can see on the reports where a very large number of accounts are like that. They're not spending it at all. So they're still engaged. Um, they're still trading. They're still pushing the price mostly upward, uh, regardless of how much bonus margin is in the market. The overall trend is up in price at a faster rate than the bonus margin is, is basically that's the measurement. That's what proves the point. Um, the bonus margin is not flowing in as fast as the price is rising. So that's just the fact of it. Uh, so that's, that's fascinating because you can neither put any direct contributions into the market. You can't directly fund your account. The only way is to get bonus margin, which is repaid as a loan only if the conversion takes place and there's no uh, liability for it if it doesn't. So that's the bet, you know, if you want to call it that. Uh, you know, that's what you're speculating on, is you're speculating on that the market will make it to conversion, that we will net out the bonus margin, and that that, that balance will be converted at some rate uh, to be used in the, in the final exempt slash uh, regulated market. So that's a reason to believe. Um, I say this with a lot of emphasis because, oh, and, and we, the market just made a, another high uh, number, actually a series of, of them over this week, but right now, it, today, on November 3rd, it made a, another high, um, market, the market caps, total market caps. So um, I say that this is really important because the dog, you know, the saying is the dog has to eat the dog food. Well, in prior attempts where there are at least three, probably five now that I would say were significant attempts uh, over the last 20 years, well, 15 years for sure, that have all failed, wiping out at least $100 million in other people's money. So um, the main reason they failed is there was no public appetite for the product. They didn't have any trading of contracts. So uh, the fact that we have trading of contracts in the market configured on this nonprofit like it is, not allowing people to put money in and only allowing the people who only put money in without any bonus mar margin programs that have stock, so they're not insiders, that's a very small number now that can take money out that haven't already taken out the limit. Uh, that That is, I mean the fact that it still trades says that the model works. So once you take all the, once you take all of the, um, the limits off of it and the restrictions and put it on a normal one-to-one -one platform like a bank or a stock market, then I'm confident that it will, um, it will explode. And it's, it's not a Ponzi scheme because a Ponzi scheme requires that everybody, that you always have to have new people coming in to, to keep it alive. And that's not the case. Uh, you don't have to have people coming in because the last person in on the platform can still make a profit. That on its that one claim breaks the Ponzi scheme basis. Um, the other is that I asked Alper specifically to go through the math back in 2009, and if there was something fundamentally flawed, meaning that we represent one to one, no bonus margin, uh, all accounts separated exactly the way it requires in the law, then would it, would it be stable? Are there any fundamental problems? And he said, no, there's not. If that would have been answered any other way, then that would have been stopped right there. So that in the, uh, also the uh, people ask, where does the source of the value come from? Well, one direct thing is future claim on dividends. As long as you're holding a contract, you have a, a claim against future payments on that on that team. So that's that's a cash basis payment. Uh, and of course, this assumes the final full on one to one market, fully regulated market. That's the reason it's a claim on future cash payments. So it's a cash settled contract. Okay. So um, on to last month. So I, for the first time in a very long time, at least a year, maybe 18 months or longer, um, the costs are now at just under $10,000 a month. And without doing something really drastic, like not being here anymore, which, I mean, it's not out of the question that 
uh, this business can be run from anywhere in the world. It can be run from a less expensive place. Um, that's true. However, I don't think that doing that suddenly uh, is going to be helpful, especially with everything being set up, travel and everything else for December. But it's not out of the question if that's what it takes, if a relocation is what's required to bring the cost down, there's only, there, it's not going to happen without leaving here. Uh, so there's that. So under 10,000 is about 2,500 a week. I, you know, there's always stuff that comes in that seems to push it up there. One thing takes up the slack where another one drops off. So that's $2,500 a week. That's a sustaining rate uh, to keep everything alive. So that's what we need to raise or, you know, we, but we basically are, insolvent and can't proceed any further because I have no no uh, further credit to extend from anywhere including my, on my own. So um, why I believe I guess you know I'm asking you look at the timeline look at the commitment I mean I have more more on the line uh, you know and I, that's the way it should be I'm not complaining I'm just saying when you when you look at where you are in your contributions to ASM I assure you that mine are greater at this point. Um, or I'm responsible for a lot larger sum than you are, no, no exceptions. So I'm just asking to get me to the end of the year so I can do the things that I've sort of been setting up for more than a year, I would say at this point, because I started talking about 2020 and getting it to the end of this year being it and we're now literally just over one month away from the New York City event. So um, we do have a uh, platform of IP that includes 24 trademarks, uh, 23 of those granted, one of them pending and probably will be granted. We have patent applications for the Sports Risk Index and the ASM platform filed all over the world, um, literally in hundreds of jurisdictions if you count all the applications. Um, that's the stuff we have to maintain. Uh, some of them have died. This is on the sports risk index and on the ASM platform. Some of them have died for various reasons, but as I pointed out in other communication that nobody can get it. If we don't get it, nobody can get it. So it's either our patent or nobody gets it. And we do have rights under common law showing that we are the inventors. I can clearly show that. Um, patents, pending, trademarks, trade dress, specialized knowledge. Basically, we created the whole category. The New York City um, event is going to focus around, well, obviously getting as much exposure as we possibly can uh, using uh, Zach, Bernie, um, whatever Ace can dream up, whatever we can get here from the C-Suite Network and the Hero Club to put out the message about the order book. There's, there's two parts build the order book and the and the education reveal. And the order book, uh, we're hoping and still working towards having this first deal announcement. But even if that doesn't happen, and I'm not saying that any change has been indicated because we're, there hasn't been any change, none that I'm aware of uh, at this point, but we have to work towards getting that message out anyway. So it's a new fundraising uh, tool for, for sports leagues and sports teams, a new way to engage fans, and the educational system to learn through sports. I mean, that's that's the three, you know, three parts of our platform, sports course, sports boat, and sports folio. Um, so there is a pitch tank session uh, on Monday in, uh, in New York on the 8th. I'm pretty sure, let me double check, that's the right date. Monday the 9th. Yeah, Monday the 9th. So uh, I, I am looking to see what it will take for us to participate in that uh, pitch tank session also. So that's a bit of, of news. Uh, all right. So I think that's everything. Um, bottom line is we have uh, just a little bit to go to pay off uh, this month's, you know, this basically this week's well, it's not this week because some of it is monthly, but all of the, uh, well, not all, but most of the expenses come now at the very end slash beginning, you know, 31-1. So this weekend, I'm uh, a little bit short of things that need to go out tomorrow. 
you can see the uh, you can see the amount and some other details in the body of the email. So I'm I guess I'm asking you just please to have a little bit more faith. Give, give me until the end of this year um, to the you know run this entire sequence that I've been working on for literally over a year, and then you can decide um, if you want to change horses or however you want to call that. We'll talk about that and. Um, I will participate in that process, whatever is required. So thank you very much for your time and enjoy your Sunday. Bye now.